this is Wine Splained. Honest talk about sustainable wine. Yeah, we're here to sip some wine, uh, explore some of the hard to answer questions around sustainable wine and the wine industry. That's right. Uh, people are constantly asking us questions, and sometimes we have the answers, but most of the time we don't. <laughs> so this is us getting back to everybody. Well, what's today's uh, segment? I think we're going to talk about iconoclasm, right? Well, what, what is that for those of us who don't know every word in the dictionary? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a dictionary definition here in front of me. Uh, and iconoclasm supposedly is the action of taking or assertively rejecting cherished beliefs and institutions or established values and practices. Uh, but then we have iconoclasm more specifically to the wine industry. It's, it's a word that we love to use in the wine industry. We, we, we cherish it and, and, and we, we hold a lot of people <clears throat> up almost on pedestals. <laughs> uh, we, we turn them into icons, almost because of their iconoclasm. Uh, for instance, uh, if we think about if we think about great iconoclasts in the wine industry, we have people like Angelo Gaia in Piedmont, uh, who completely revolutionized the region of Barbaresco. Uh, I know people can argue with me, take issue with me about that, but he did. He 100% did, uh, for better or worse. That's what he did. Um, we have Mas de Damas Gasak down in the Languedoc, right outside of the city of Montpellier in the Larzac region. And once again, they came down there. They, they, they decided that they wanted to grow some Cabernet Sauvignon down there and a bunch of other grape varieties. And they and said, you are doing that. Wrong thing. <laughs> everybody, yeah, everybody was like, what the hell are you doing? Um, but they, they, they built their brand around this, 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 this iconoclastic idea. Um, but they also actually, and, and so did Angelo Gaia, what they both did is they actually raised wine prices for people in their community. So the, the people who were actually making wine in Barbaresco were able to make more money off of their wine. The people in the Larzac region uh, had the choice of finally, uh, <laughs> maybe not selling to the co-op and maybe uh, thinking, hey, I can, I can actually be my own wine maker. And, and, and they, 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 did, they did what they intended to do, which is they brought a certain level of prestige uh, to that community uh, that wasn't there before. Uh, you know, we think about Angelo Gaia, who uh, plants Cabernet Sauvignon in his uh, vineyards that were slated for Nebbiolo. And obviously those vineyards were much better suited for Nebbiolo. Uh, and he likes Nebbiolo more than Cabernet, but he, he grew it there anyway. So he, he did it for a point. Um, but luckily today we also have with us John Paul, Cameron Winery, uh, one of uh, my favorite people in the Willamette Valley. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely delight to talk to yeah. as well. Um, and 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 you you came up here in 1984. 1984, right. and um, and actually the original iconoclast in Oregon, David Led, is the one who kind of led me up here because when he came up. In the 60s, anybody who was anybody would have gone, you're crazy, you can't grow Vitus vinifera in Oregon, and he proved them wrong. And, and I could immediately see from California that he was the guy doing it. So Right, yeah. Yeah. I would love to, you know, like, so you, 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 you were in Napa, is that right? I was in Napa, yep. Yeah. I was in the center of it. That was a great time to be in the Napa Valley because the 70s and into the 80s was kind of its 
I think, really its high point. It was when things were really happening. There was a lot of innovation going on. I met all kinds of people from Burgundy because their dads had sent them over there to get hold of what the hell was going on in California because you'd had the Stephen Spurrier tastings and all these California wines were suddenly front and center. And, um, and so it was just happening. So it was, it was, it was a cool place to be. So, so, so you, you came up here in 1984. 84. And, and, and you, were, you were close on the heels of sort of what I think of as like kind of like the first generation of yeah. organ producers. And like, so we talk about the Letts. Who else are you thinking that kind of paved the way for? At, well, David was the one who really paved the way. He, right. was, he was the one I was looking at the most. But once I got up here, you know, the Ponzi's were making really significant wine, um, and you had a lot of just personalities who were just fabulous. Myron Redford, right. yeah, he like, <laughs> was just, you know, he wasn't always making necessarily the best wine, but I never cared. He was just such, he was a hoot to be around. Right. And so there was a lot of that, people that were just, um, just going, doing their own thing, and out on the edge, right. and, and, and learning. Because, you know, this was a new climate, so you couldn't just come from California, for example, and, and take all, everything you could learn there immediately. Well, was there some of that uh, at the beginning of the industry? I know uh, I've seen a few labels of, you know, Willamette Valley Cabernet Sauvignon from, like, 1970s, 1980s. But I can't imagine that was the foundations ever. <laughs> well, no. well. For example, um, it, you know, along this this thought, um, Dick Erath had an early wine that he called Coastal Mist, M I S T, Mist. We would say <laughs> Mist, Mist in his language meant shit, oh, and, no. and so it was an inside joke oh. that you know yeah. that he had made this stuff that didn't work out at all, mm. but he needed to sell it, so he called it right. Coastal Mist. You know, mm. and if you were on the inside, that was that was pretty funny. Um, so, you know, and the very first vintage that I ended up doing here had no relationship to anything I'd experienced in California. 1984 is still arguably one of the worst vintages ever <laughs> in Oregon. It started raining in early October and it never stopped. And the crop, um, we didn't really know about dropping crop yet then. Uh -huh. And so the crop was too high. And I was bringing in things that were 17, 18 bricks and learning the art of capitalization. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, I had just come back from working vintage in New Zealand, where at least at that point, capitalization was, was like what you did. So I knew all, I even had my British capitalizing tables right. with me. And I yeah. still have those. If I have to capitalize, yeah. I still go to those old. It's imperial gallons, and yeah. you know. It, it, so you just dumping sugar into the into the into yeah, the and, and right sometimes there. you yeah, have to yeah. do that if yeah. if yeah. Uh, you don't get it by nature, then you make it up. So 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 let he he, he led you up here. You you, you kind of came up here because there was this sort of iconoclast uh, who dared to grow. I mean. Who the hell is like, we're going to hang our hat on one of the most important grape varieties on the planet? Right. <laughs> there you are. And I'm working for, a, for what was considered at the time the premier Pinot Noir producer in the Napa Valley, Carneros Creek Winery, okay. which had been started by these guys that had an importing company that were bringing in Domain Romani Conti. Uh -huh. and, um, and so they were in, quote, the cool area right. of Napa Valley right. down in the Carneros. And, um, and so, you know, and making, making really good Pinot Noir, but all these guys that I met in the Napa Valley from Burgundy, I then went and visited. And I realized as soon as I got to Burgundy that topographically, everything about it had nothing to do with the Bay Area. And it totally reminded me of Oregon. Right. And that was when I kind of went, oh, that guy let up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. he's, he's got it right. Right. Because A, you know, latitude is important and, and he was on more of a similar latitude than California was and, and just the nature of things that growing around you, what it looks like, right. it looked more like Burgundy up here than it did in California. So those those kind of things had a big impact on me. And I right. realized that 
David was was probably on to something. And I, I mean, so you have your origin story. I feel like Oregon has its origin story, right? And it's an origin story founded in iconoclasm. I, I think it is, yeah. I, I think absolutely. I mean, when I came up, when I left the Napa Valley, and mm -hmm. keep in mind, it's like going strong. Everybody wants to be in the Napa Valley. And I'm pulling up and heading north. Right. People looked at me like I was nuts, right. including my wife. She thought <laughs> I was nuts, too. And, um, and there was a lot of friction for a long time because, because of that. Why, right. could I, why would I leave the Napa Valley to head up here for right. something completely unproven right. and, and, you know, taking a chance? I think you, you are following that same, like, spirit of independence that we like to talk about Oregonians possessing um, in politics and what we do and how we talk to each other. And it started with the, the, the migration across from the Midwest to Oregon that these people, they would have their wagon train and apparently what I read was that the, or, the guys going to Oregon would be like, there would be a leader of the wagon train, but you were allowed to deviate from what he wanted to do and do your own thing if you wanted to. And that's still, at least until right. I think fairly recent, and maybe even still now, that kind of typified the Oregon wine industry. So it goes, it goes yeah. way back. It's, it's kind of almost the DNA of, of where we're from. Yeah. So, so, so here we are. We're in the Willamette Valley. We, we have this tradition of iconoclasm. We planted Pinot Noir because we just did. And do we, f I mean, here's the question. Right now, as we sit here in Oregon and in the Willamette Valley, do we have a false sense of iconoclasm? Like our I, I think absolutely, because yeah. now we've been doing this long enough. We, <laughs> are, we are, you know, pretty internationally known now mm -hmm. for making the wines of, of Burgundy, Pinot Noir, and right. Chardonnay. And a lot of people are not iconoclasm. Class. They fall totally into that and wouldn't think of doing anything else. It wouldn't right. occur to them that there might be other things you can do right. or deal with these grape varieties in a different way. Right. Um, that's not iconoclasm. Right. Iconoclasm it's, is kind of looking at what you have and kind of going, okay, so this is the cherished belief, but maybe that's not the only thing out there. Maybe there's something else. That, I mean, there are thousands of grape varietals that are named. And countless unnamed bridles, and we're still focusing on. We got Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris and Chardonnay. And 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 to be fair, <laughs> they really are good for yeah, yeah, here. Right. They do yeah. really well. Yeah. There are some great wines being made. In them. We probably made should be the growing same. them here still. Absolutely, they, they are. They are still the, the. They're the thing that drives the ship. There's there's no doubt about it. And when I started making Nebbiolo, when I started planting Nebbiolo and playing around with it in the mid '90s, David Led himself came to me said, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. How can you be doing Nebbiolo? The, the original iconoclast. And I, I remember I looked at him and I said, David, do you know what making this wine is proof of? And he goes, what? And I said, it's proof that I'm making money now and I can do some, try some different things yeah. that are not in the mainstream and see how it works. And I remember he looked at me and got a big smile and said, that's great. Oh, that's you know, awesome. So. So, so, like, you know, like, we think of iconoclasm. I mean, I, I feel like the original root sort of definition that we led with, the sort of idea of breaking social mores, of tearing down idols, of going contradictory uh, to what is around you or what has come before you. Is there... Is there a possibility of a sustained iconoclasm? Like, how does a person sustain iconoclasm? I, I think the nature of the term is that as soon as something becomes kind of a cherished belief, and let's mm -hmm. face it, growing Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are yeah. now kind of cherished beliefs, if you simply fall into that, mm -hmm. you're no longer an iconoclast. And, right. and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but I think the way you move forward is with iconoclastic people 
who are in the mix, who are challenging what's going on and trying to reinvent what, what's taking place. I think that's important, but I don't think, um, I don't think iconoclasm just follows inherently. Right. I mean, do, do you think there is a link between iconoclasm and sort of just continuing to do your own thing? So, like, I, I feel like, like some of the, some, you know, we see a lot of trends happening. In one, right? you know? <laughs> we see the modernists come in. We see the Gaias come in. They threw a bunch of Nebbiolo and 700% new oak. Uh, and, uh, but then, you know, the through line through that are producers and, and, and Barbaresco that just kept doing their own thing. And then suddenly... They're kind of the economy. They class. become revolutionary, yes. right? Well, and that's been happening here as well. As you well know, my deal with promoting dry farming, which is how you did it here initially, and mm -hmm. then coming up from California where those Stephen Spurrier tastings that I mentioned sucked all this money into Napa Valley, and then it became, how do we protect these investments? Right. And then came irrigation. Right. Because all of those wines that did so well in that Stephen Spurrier tasting, those were all dry farm vineyards, mm -hmm. every one of them. They were all 12, 12.5% 12 alcohol. I drunk a lot of those wines from the, I think it was 74 vintage. And, and they were fabulous, and they were dry farmed, and they were low in alcohol. Then comes all this irrigation, which just myself coming out, and I'm showing up in the Napa Valley when everything's starting to go irrigated, and I'm coming out of a famous research lab in Berkeley, and I'm driving up in the Napa Valley, and I'm seeing all of this irrigation and big, huge canopies, and it just <laughs> turned out that the research that I've been doing now there had to do with what leaves export mm -hmm. to the rest of the plant. And there's one and only one compound that leaves send to the rest of the plant, and that is sugar, sucrose. And I have a published paper on this because we were blown away that that was everything that was coming out of the leaf. There was nothing else. You'd have the photosynthetic area, and it was everything. And then outside of that, because we had everything darkened, all it was was sugar. So I drove up through the Napa Valley. I see all this irrigation in these now huge leaf canopies. And I'm going, well, that's going to make a whole lot of sugar. And that's going to go down into the fruit. And it seems to me the alcohols are going to start going up. And all of a sudden, Napa Valley became known for 15, 16% alcohol wines. Delicious. Which is, and, and of course, their response to all this in this legislation that passed a few years ago, a tax legislation, mm -hmm. was to change the definition of table wine. Table wine has yeah. always been. 12 to 14 percent alcohol. That's what table wine is. In the United States, they changed the definition to now it can be 16 percent. It's ridiculous. Which, which is ridiculous, <laughs> and it's and it's totally an economic thing because these guys are having to pay a bunch of taxes. Right. Yeah. On over 14 percent. So now all the irrigation is starting to go in up here, and suddenly those of us who are practicing dry farming are now the iconic class. So right. yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. So it. I, so I, I feel, you know, I, I feel like on, on one level, like we, we think of iconoclasm as sort of this notion of intentionally setting out to destroy social mores, like just tearing down idols. But, but, but I, I think what I'm hearing from you is that there is a sense of, you know, good iconoclasm perhaps is, is actually more productive. It's actually saying like, how am I being true to sort of a sense that I have about the place around me, about the potential around me, and, and, and moving forward? Well, and, and so along that line, it can very well be respecting, um, it can become a iconoclastic to respect tradition, right. because tradition <laughs> is where a lot of things evolved, let's take Pinot Noir. The clones, the old Burgundy clones that I have are the result of hundreds of years of growers 
finding a mutation in the vineyard saying, ooh, this is cool, I'm gonna propagate this. And propagating it. And now, over time, you have hundreds of really cool clones coming out of these iconic vineyards in Burgundy. And, and by going after that, which is really old and traditional, you are in a way being iconoclastic because the nowadays the cherished beliefs in agriculture are you go for the things that the university gives you, the university researchers, and that's about more production and high trying yields. to high yields yeah. and trying to manipulate sugar and, and acid in, in those grapes. And all of a sudden going back to the old type these old clones and planting them in a mixed scene rather than a single variety, single clone being planted, suddenly we become iconoclastic right. doing that. So. Well, I mean, this, this is sort of the, the market trend as well, right? Like tying it back to sustainability. We're all trying to be uh, you know, green to some extent, whether we're actively trying or yeah. marketing us as, <laughs> as such. Yeah. Um, but, and, and then the natural line. You know, which, which I think a lot of us want to believe in, but there's no, there's no true definitions. But basically, it goes back to like the old ways. Um, so, so all these winemakers that are pursuing that uh, natural side are, are just moving back to traditions right. that we've had. In the and past. suddenly, they're iconoclast. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally fair. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, I want to get back to the natural just a natural wine, and we should probably touch on that here in a minute. But I do want to, you know, ask the question, is iconoclasm worth anything if it's not successful? Like, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I would say so, because it's kind of like going back to my roots as a research scientist. It's like, it's like, is applied research the only thing that's worth something, or is basic research where you don't really see where you're things are going, is that mm -hmm. worth anything? And yet applied research is right. all based upon basic research that came before it. And I would say iconoclasm that right. doesn't necessarily initially result in anything right. so maybe mean, marketable. It's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily disqualify it. Right. It's, it's, it's part of the process. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think about, I think about that a bit because I, I think that with success you have a platform. And so, like, you're able to make your Nebbiolo and kind of poke a finger into, like, the idea of what we are growing in the Willamette Valley based on your success. Right? Structurally, you, I mean, you even said that earlier, right? You're like, I can do this because I'm, I, I've already been successful. I have something else that I can... I don't have to make money on this right. because I have other things to sustain my business. And my wife has always made fun of this particular product <laughs> because it's taken a huge amount of my time and ingenuity, you know, and learning to do it. And I come out with this thing that takes four years before I can release it. So my present vintage is a Pinot Noir 2019, and this is 2017. And I sell this for literally half the price of the Clolac Treat that comes off the same vineyard. So right. Terry goes, yeah, well, this makes sense. So it takes <laughs> twice as long to get it to market, and you sell it for half the right. price. That's, right. you know, it's so. The cost baked into aging. Right. And, I mean, not right. to mention the years planting the vineyard and ah. waiting for fruit, especially dry farming. Yeah. So. But it's, it's a passion. And, mm. and I would say that that's probably a characteristic of a lot of class as well, right. is that they're passionate about some idea that they have, right. and they, they're not necessarily going at it thinking that they're attacking cherished right. beliefs, they right. just got this passion for yeah. this thing, right. which kind of is attacking cherished beliefs, but that's not what really motivates them. But we have iconoclasm in the wine industry as a market value, right? <laughs> I mean, just like terroir is sort of this sort of thing that we... You know, like speaking of Gaia, speaking of Mas de Damas Cossack, like, um, I mean, when I visited, and no, no disrespect to Mas de Damas Cossack, love their wines, but when I visited their property down in the Larzac, like, everybody in the parking lot was driving a 
very nice car. You know, like, <laughs> um, they're, they, they, they're doing well. Uh, I think they've done well. Uh, but, but there is, and, and iconoclasm becomes part of their story. It becomes part of how we, you know, it's how we brand the Willamette Valley, right? So it's like, um, is there room for us, you know, to be iconoclastic again? Is the natural wine movement, for instance, with all of these people who, you know, when I moved to Portland back in 2000, everybody moved to Portland so they could be in a rock and roll band. And so we were all working like serving jobs so that we could like play music at night. And now, you know, the last 10 years, I feel like everybody I know is waiting tables so they can be a winemaker. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, there are what, 700 wineries in Oregon or 800 wineries? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think going back to the, the earlier story I was talking about on dry farming, mm -hmm. um, those guys, and we're a small cadre of people, but. I'm sure the majority of the grapes now, because of very large producers up here, are, are ironically irrigated. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, we're a group of iconoclasts mm -hmm. that are right. following that dry farm thing. And you can't be a member of the Deep Roots Coalition if you purchase any irrigated fruit at all. Right. Everything you do, whether you farm it or whether you buy it for your winery, has to be dry farm. That's, that's kind of going to the mat over. And right. I would say that's still iconoclastic and in, in, you know, in the larger sense of things. So, yeah, I think this industry still has a lot of that going on, which, which is great. Um, but I think uh, there are a lot of vineyards and wineries that are maybe still trying to you know, hold on to that right. iconoclasm when they're kind of not. Right. Do you, I mean, do you, do you think iconoclasm right now has to be kind of quieter? I mean, like it's, you know dry farming, sort of these, these ideas, these structures that happen in the vineyard that uh, might be tricky to bring over to the marketing side, you know, as opposed to like a... You know, with climate change, it's getting easier and more obvious, a lot of those things. Right. Sustainability and dry farming, you know, with droughts and all this kind of stuff suddenly becomes a marketing tool. Yeah. Big yeah. time marketing right. tool. Yeah, yeah. And the public is becoming really receptive. I mean, people down in the Napa Valley, we have some members, you know, of growers in the Napa Valley who are part of the Deep Roots Coalition. Oh, right. And, and, it's, and it's, yeah. a, it's a, absolutely a marketing thing for them, Frog Sleep Wine. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you, you know, drive but up again, the valley and you see all these irrigated vines that are like this big around. Because I was just down there in shock because...